formidable force such as you meets an old immovable object like me. You can bet as sure as you live. Something's gotta give, something's gotta give, something's gotta give. If you're having a hard time placing this Marilyn Monroe film, that's because it was never made. I'm Henry Shipper for Fox Entertainment News, and this was our idea of how Monroe's last unfinished film, a bedroom comedy called Something's Got to Give, might have opened had it ever reached the screen. It didn't, because Monroe was fired after eight weeks of filming, here on stage 14 at 20th Century Fox. She was sacked for what the studio described as spectacular absenteeism, and it was hinted for drifting through her scenes in a depressed and drug-induced haze. Two months later, Monroe was found dead, an apparent suicide at the age of 36. Her death seemed to validate the studio's version of her professional slide, and it's been accepted ever since that her work on Something's Got to Give was a sad finale to an otherwise spectacular career, better left forgotten and unseen. What is little known, however, is that 20th Century Fox liked Monroe's work enough to rehire her to finish the film, shortly before she died. In fact, Monroe never looked better, and as you'll soon see, her work on Something's Got to Give is on a par with the rest of her career. Funny, touching, at times superb. Monroe's performance in this film has never before been publicly shown. The negative for most of the footage was either stolen or destroyed shortly after she died, and it wasn't until 1982 that a faded print was discovered by accident in a cluttered warehouse on the 20th Century Fox lot. These eight boxes contain nearly six hours of unedited scenes from Something's Got to Give. The color has deteriorated on much of the print, but Marilyn's performance has not, and it's easy to see why Fox rehired her to finish the film. The fact that she never did makes these raw fragments that much more fascinating and valuable. The footage you're about to see paints a portrait of Monroe during the final months of her life, struggling with depression and fear, but also working hard as an actress and lighting up the screen like only she could. To the very end, Marilyn Monroe had a beauty and a sexual glow that no other actress could touch, and that came across in all her films, even the one that never got made. These costume and makeup tests were shot on April 10, 1962. Marilyn Monroe, the sex symbol of the 1950s, was 35 years old. She'd been puffy and overweight in her last few films, but Monroe lost 15 pounds before the start of Something's Got to Give and looked better than she had in years. And she was like a goddess. She was so, her skin was white, it was perfect, it wasn't, you know, and she looked just absolutely beautiful. Her body was in beautiful condition. Her figure was never better. Her face was terrific. The young, fleshy part of the face had gone, and I think it was just maturity that she had arrived at, uh, you know, becoming a woman. Great, great, and she was very happy. She was really, she didn't have to perform. She just had to look great. And she did. I thought we were it. I really did. Looking good had never been a problem for Marilyn Monroe. The trick was getting her on set and in front of the camera. Intensely insecure as an actress, emotionally, physically, at times mentally fragile, Monroe had caused enormous delays on her recent movies by avoiding scenes, arriving on the set hours, sometimes days late. You mean about getting here on time? Yes, I was punctual. Yeah. Oh, you were punctual. Does this mean you've turned over a new leaf? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> You're going to be prompt from now on? Yes. <laughs> Monroe herself told friends she was psychologically incapable of getting anywhere on time, and punctuality, it soon became obvious, was still a problem, along with more serious maladies. The morning after these exquisite tests were taken, producer Henry Weinstein found Monroe in her newly purchased Brentwood home in a barbiturate coma. This whole thing frightened me, of course, and, uh, and I realized that she was even more unstable than 
I was led to believe, and I went to the studio and reported this and said, I don't think you can go on with the picture. And they said, no, no, it's okay, we'll go on. If Monroe seemed on the verge of a breakdown, so did 20th Century Fox. The once proud studio was teetering toward bankruptcy, reeling from losses produced by this film. Cleopatra. Two years in the making on location in Rome, with an out-of-control budget and another frequently absent, notoriously difficult star. Initially pegged to cost $5 million, Cleopatra, with Liz Taylor and Richard Burton making love and war on and off the set, would eventually cost an unheard of $30 million to produce. So dire was Fox's financial condition that the studio was forced to shut down its commissary, stop watering its lawns, and pull the plug on all its productions except one. All right, camera! Something's got to give. There was only one reason Fox was determined to make the movie, Marilyn Monroe. Though her last few films hadn't done so well, Monroe's name still represented at least the possibility of box office magic, and Fox was desperate for a hit. Besides, Fox could get Monroe on the cheap. The actress owed the studio one last film on a 1956 contract, a contract that gave her the bargain basement salary of $100,000, one-tenth of what Fox paid Liz for Cleopatra. The bargain, of course, was only a bargain if Monroe showed up with reasonable frequency on the set. For the first week, she didn't show up at all, calling in sick with sinusitis and a virus that the studio wasn't sure was real or imagined. She was homesick on April 24th, the day the Shah of Iran paid a visit to the 20th Century Fox lot, mingled with the stars, and dropped in on the studio's only active production. It's an interesting backstage tour for the handsome Shah and his beautiful Empress Farah. Topped off by a look at a rehearsal of a scene for Something's Got to Give. Sid Charisse and Steve Allen are the principals in the rehearsal. The star the Shah really wanted to meet was Marilyn Monroe. But when producer Weinstein went to Monroe's house to pick her up, she resisted on unexpected grounds. You gotta come. You must do this, Marilyn. Now, this is nothing to do. We're not going to shoot you. This is no trap. You have to do it. She said, well, I don't know whether I can. I said, why? She said, I don't know what Iran's relationship with Israel is. I said, no, Marilyn. Weinstein quickly placed a call to this Hollywood synagogue and put Marilyn on the phone with Rabbi Max Nussbaum, otherwise known as the rabbi to the stars. And the rabbi said, no, no, we have very good relations with Iran, and it would be very good indeed if you showed on the set. So I was able to take it to the set, now with the rabbi's blessing, and I became a hero. Weinstein would have been a bigger hero if he'd been able to get Monroe on the set for work. Two weeks would pass before she clocked in on April 30th for the first time. Despite a fever of 101 and a sore throat that kept her from reading many lines, Monroe was well prepared and ready to work. She spent the day emoting silently, doing take after take of this scene, in which she plays a mother for the first and only time since becoming a star. Here, she sees her children after a separation of five years. Watch as Marilyn takes her time, feeling her way through the emotions of the scene. Something's Got to Give was intended as a remake of a 1939 romantic comedy called My Favorite Wife, starring Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. The character played by Dunn and Monroe has been lost on a tropical island for five years. Marilyn returns home on the day her husband, played by Dean Martin, remarries. Sid Charisse is his new bride. <laughs> 